1. My father-in-law just retired trucking and is helping his sons have a small local delivery company. They mostly work with some hardware stores that offer free shipping. That way they get more sales. Then they call some delivery companies and use the cheapest one. The terms for the free shipping are that it is curbside. If they want anything else, they have to pay extra. So last week, they had this customer that asked for a lot of construction materials since they were remodeling their home. My in-law went to the place and the customer asked him to put the materials in the backyard. He said that it was a curb delivery and that their truck wouldn't be able to drive there easily. Basically, the customer, a 60-year-old, asked very politely to help them since they had no way to move the stuff and they couldn't have it in the front porch for safety and HOA reasons. Well, my father-in-law told him that he would need to back up and drive over the grass which was wet. This basically took 20 to 30 minutes just to be able to back up the truck to the backyard and obviously made a bit of a mess in the front garden. But easier to fix some grass and to move a few tons of construction materials. He did this for free and just to be a nice person. The next day, my father-in-law gets a call from the hardware store that the customer was very upset that they messed up their front garden and blah blah blah. That they ended up giving the customer some credit notes and gift cards. Father-in-law told them that they wouldn't be charging for that delivery or would give them the next curbside delivery for free. Well, guess what? Yesterday, they got a new delivery to the same address with the same person. This time, a lot of sheetrock panels, 2 by 4s and I don't remember what else. But, well, construction material. The customer asked the same, curbside delivery. Father-in-law first of all apologized for driving over the grass. And, you know, all the apologetic stuff you do to keep your client happy. But here is a malicious compliance. Right when the customer was like, don't worry, it's okay, you can drop it in the backyard. Father-in-law was like, no can do. I'm dropping it here as stipulated in this invoice you signed. According to my father-in-law, the customer was fuming, called the store. The store didn't really care much. They spent the best part of an hour discussing and father-in-law wouldn't budge. Finally, he was like, if you don't want to receive it, it's okay. It's already paid. I will just return it to the store. But I believe they will charge you a restocking fee. So they had to make a choice. Receive the stuff and move it himself, or return it and have the contractors unable to do anything the next day. So he decided the first. Father-in-law left everything nicely accommodated on the curbside and left. Two. So, underlying context first. This all happens a good ten years ago now, when I had my very first job, right after school. I was 17 years old then, had no clue about labor laws, and was working as a metal worker for a small five-man business. The boss was from Sicily, and thought himself a better Don Corleone. The other workers were one actual worker, a 50-plus old-school chief that forgot more than others ever knew and kept the entire shop running. An apprentice in his fourth and last year, Robin, an arrogant prick but pretty competent. Then there was the apprentice of the first year who was always stoned, weed kept growing out of his ears, and then there was me, a more theoretically oriented guy who wanted to work in the IT sector. But since my dad considered me too dumb for it, second best grades in every subject in my finishing year, but that's another topic. And he paid for my applications, back then on paper. He had me do some proper work. The boss himself was working in the office doing the designing of the stuff we would cut up, build, weld, and install. I had two left hands, coming fresh from school, but if the boss grabbed a screwdriver, well, jump in a ditch, put a helmet on, and start praying. He was a walking catastrophe on two legs. He always hired himself people with either no clue about labor laws or no other choice, so he could pretty much do as he pleased. The one year I worked there, according to my contract, minimum wage of course, I accumulated a good 200 overtime hours, which I didn't have any proof about, so I could smear them up my rear. The actual story. So, we were on a construction site, a good one and a half hour drive from our shop. We were supposed to install 14 3.10 meter tall, 122 inch, 
and 1.5 meter 59 inch broad panes of glass. Those were made out of double layered safety glass, a good 4 centimeters, that's about 1.6 inches thick, with a layer of tough clear foil in between. So really heavy bastards. A good 200 kilograms or 440 pounds or so. Those panes of glass were supposed to go into the rails in the ceiling and floor, creating solid secure glass walls for an office. The normal ceiling was around 2.6 meters tall. So we had to use suction cups to bring them in angled, which was really a pain, like, literally. The problem? So we ran into a problem pretty quickly, that while the ceiling was 2.60 above the floor, and the glasses were 3.10, there's a good lack of space around half a meter, about 20 inches. The rails in the ceiling and the floor added another 5 centimeters each. So we ended up with the glasses being 40 centimeters too long. Turns out Boss had been ordering them wrong. Ah, oh, crap. So we called the boss, he's still being back at home in the shop, telling him the problem, which he was infuriated about, as if we extended the glass somehow. We then tried to call multiple companies in the area who work with glass, if they could come in and cut the glass on the construction site. As soon as they heard double-layered safety glass, each and every one of them outright refused, said the glass was more likely to break than to be cut with anything short than an industrial-sized laser cutter. Or water cutter, for that matter. The solution, and malicious compliance, so after calling every glass company within 30 minutes of the construction site, which they refused to request, our boss had the glorious idea that if the professionals chicken out, we for metal workers, of which only one had finished the apprenticeship, should do the job with our diamond cutter, something you use to cut normal thin glass. We looked at ourselves, Stoner was just giggling mad as usual, speechless for a moment, before our chief asked the boss if he, the boss, was really sure about this. Because there was simply no way in hell all the glass would survive when the professionals gave us a 50-50 chance. Chief gave us a 10 over 90 chance of any glass surviving. Boss said he was absolutely sure. After all, our chief could do everything. And if one or two glasses break, it would be better than nothing. Because we, the workers, couldn't just drive home and have no progress on the construction site whatsoever to show for when the customer would do an inspection. Our chief asked once more if the boss was sure. That way, he was okay with the risk that a good number of glasses would break, and knowing our boss... We had him on speaker and recorded what he said. Well, he said it a second time, that he was sure and that he would take this one on him. As if ordering the stuff wrong had not been on him, he then spent ten minutes arguing with the chief who insisted to go and quickly buy a new sharp diamond cutter, as ours was dull as a troll's club. Boss didn't like the expense of like two hundred dollars, but he eventually allowed it. Problem with cutting glass is you cut one side, turn it around, and then bend it careful against the cut. But when you have double layered glass, yeah, joke's on you, basically. Well, we then unloaded all the glasses carefully until we only had one on our truck. Carefully cut one side with the new diamond cutter, poured some flammable liquid in the cut, and ignited it to melt the foil layer. Then we turned the whole thing around cut the other side and started to carefully move the top part back and forth to widen the cut until it would crack all the way through. From the 14 glasses, 11 were killed with a crack suddenly going down, splitting the entire length in half. So three glasses survived the massacre and the rest had to be reordered completely by our boss instead of just being sent in for a professional cut with a proper machine. He later complained about why we did this, and we simply played him the recording of him twice saying he was all fine with it. He kept grumbling and making snarky remarks, but in all honesty, this was just one of many instances. So we simply nodded and ignored him. He could have gone after the chief if he pressed the issue, but without the chief, nothing would run in this shop, and the boss really knew it. I was, like, on my second last month and already had the contract for my proper apprenticeship. Somewhere else, of course. Already signed and sealed. 
so it was not like I cared one iota anymore anyway at that point. Hope this memory of mine made you smile. Jessica does make me smile even a decade later. 3. Several years ago, I worked in a print shop. We did large format printing. Think larger than billboards, example entire building faces, and high quality art prints. Basically, we were living in the niche the large companies did not want to bother with. Sometimes when a lot of work piled up, I helped out by sticking brackets on the back of pictures on which they would hang on the wall and subsequent packaging of the product. On the work card accompanying the job, the width and height of the picture were marked, but a certain salesperson often tended to mix this up. Not much of an issue if the motive is clear. You would just use common sense. But as I said, we also did art and, well, you might assume a certain way is up, but that might not be what the artist intended. And sometimes the motive was totally abstract and you had no possible way of knowing. Even the width and height information, if correct, would not help because you could easily flip the thing 180 degrees and see no issue. Trust me, the artist would have issues. So you would pester the salesperson if what was on the work card was correct. He did not like being pestered. Having had enough unpleasant back and forth myself with said salesperson, who was an added bonus was Big Boss's son. Mm-hmm. And having witnessed even more unpleasanter backs and forths with the people doing this job regularly, I had a plan that just needed the salesperson to fuck up and the picture to be just right. Oh, and as an added bonus after sticking the brackets on, there was only packaging left, so the next eyes on the product would be the customers. Cue malicious compliance. You think we are stupid because we do a trivial job. I'll show you stupid. And following the work instructions exactly to the letter, I glued the brackets on so that a beautiful artsy picture of an English garden had the vegetation pointing sideways. Due to the particular brackets on this picture, the customer had the total freedom of having the trees pointing left or right. I don't judge your preferences. The only important part was to keep the work instructions somehow out of the trash until the package arrived at the customer. Sure enough, fuming customer calls big boss, fuming big boss calls salesperson, fuming salesperson calls me. I shrug. In the meantime, salesperson realizes his fuck up and retroactively changes the work instructions to cover his ass. Yes, we were at the hide your fuck up stage of rotten work culture at that point. Everybody stomps into the shop floor, where I just pulled out a slightly crumpled up work instruction that miraculously survived the weekly cleanup from under some stuff, which surprisingly contradicts the one the salesperson is waving around. Big Boss's anger redirects, and he has a private discussion with his son. You could quite clearly make out the key discussion points through the door. It did not change anything in the work culture. I left the company and the company failed soon after, but we had a good laugh that day. I like to think that salesperson now has to work a job in a real job environment without daddy. I hope the customer was compensated for the trouble I put him through. It was worth it. 4. I was working at an electronics distribution company that also had middleman contracts with several big box stores. I had an ever ignorant manager, so I was the only person for about four years to handle more than 15 major retail outlet setups. The setups were basically what you would see on, let's say, bestbuy.com if you were looking to buy a TV. Whatever TV you clicked on for the particular brand there was a big chance I was responsible for it. The images, tech specs, dimensions, and other technical information was input by me and me alone. As I said, I was the only person in my company that knew how to do my job for these specific companies, and for years, I was asked for some support from my manager as well as the CEO, whom I worked closely with because of the urgency of some parts of my job. Every time I requested a review for a raise, the goalpost kept being moved. I became bitter with the job, but I needed it for the money. 
even though I was being severely and grossly underpaid, according to the salary average for the job to the tune of about 20000 for the state and 40000 for the nation. Onto the malicious compliance. My job required me to use a computer. My computer was insanely cheap, and for some reason they would buy refurbished and old computers for IT to fix and install an illegal version of Windows on. Whatever. One day, IT sends an email to download and install Windows 10 from the link they sent. My computer was especially old, and could not handle having this loaded onto it. I informed IT, and they told me that I should speak to my manager and CEO about a new computer. I did. They said no, and to install the program anyway. So, guess what the fuck I did. I installed Windows 10 on that old ass work computer and watched as the madness began. The first major issue was that my PC said it would take 48 hours to finish. The second was that my PC was the only one in the entire company with the information necessary to complete my job functions. The third being a huge business partner's first order was to be finished setting up by me with a deadline of 24 hours. 48 minus 24 equals 24. So, yeah, that didn't get done, and the relationship was dissolved by the partner company, and my company missed out on a bunch of money. CEO and manager asked me why I did this, and I tell them they both instructed me to do the same thing, after I gave them numerous documented updates and requests for better equipment or support which they denied. There was nothing they could do as I was following their direction. I left the company shortly after, when my HR, CEO, and my manager didn't believe or acknowledge my multitude of complaints about a co-worker that constantly made racist and prejudiced statements in the workplace about black people. I'm black, for the record. They were racist, inconsiderate, people abusers that loved pizza parties but not happy employees. And I'm happy they missed the money. About 20 million. Fuck them. Fuck him sideways and fuck him raw dog. Five. I used to work at a company booking travel, among other things. It was a stressful, busy job, compounded by a terrible manager. To this day, I can't tell what she did except watch over everyone's shoulder and complain to them about how they were doing their jobs. When I started, I asked my manager for the login and password for their travel site. She asked me to just use my own personal travel accounts. It was concerning to me, but there were no laws against it that I knew of, so I used the one travel website I knew had the best deals. My new job was at a small company, and I was trying to help them in whatever way I could. I had suggested before this happened that they create a business account at this website, as they gave discount points for all travel booked, to be used for future travel. She declined because she didn't want to pay the, at the time, roughly $100 annual fee. Over the two years I was there, I discovered that my manager used whatever she could in the company to her own personal advantage. Whenever there were events and places she wanted to visit, she'd have me book her travel so she could manage the event. Then when she was there, she'd assign someone else to keep an eye on things so that she could go shopping, visit friends or family in the area, etc. When she arrived, she'd have me book everyone in a basic room and have me book her a suite at three or four times the price of a regular room. She would hold weekly department meetings at lunchtime at expensive restaurants, make us pay for our lunches by giving her cash, then expense the lunch. If we didn't have cash, she got really irritated. After a few times doing this, I realized what she was doing and I told her I was strapped for cash and only had five or ten dollars for lunch. She stopped inviting me every week and would just invite me once a month or so after that, which was great with me, and I kept using my excuse. She continued to do things like that throughout my two years there. After I got another job at another company offering twice as much and with much more autonomy, I put in my two weeks notice. She asked me for three or four weeks and I declined. What I haven't mentioned yet is that because I had been concerned about this issue, I had called this travel company at the beginning of my employment to ask them about my points. I already had a lot of personal points when I started at this company. 
I had been on the losing end of companies I worked at before with various issues before and didn't want it happening again. The travel company informed me my points accrued on my personal account were mine alone, and there was no way to separate or move points to another account. A month after I left, I started getting voicemails from my ex-boss and one of her buddies who kissed up to her and adopted many of her behaviors. They told me they needed all the points I accrued over two years from my own personal account for a company event. When I told them the company wasn't able to transfer points to their account, they demanded I give them access to my account. I then scheduled a call with the travel company with both of them on the line with me, already knowing the answer we'd get. The travel rep informed my boss and her flunky that because I had booked all the travel on my personal account, the points were mine. When they told the rep they wanted access to my account, the rep declined to do so, and told the two ladies that any further attempt would be considered harassment. We all got off the phone, and I immediately booked two trips, paid in full with my points, one to the Caribbean, and one to South America. What an awesome feeling. Hey everybody, Halfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 153. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please hit the like button. It's been saying nasty things about you. Don't let it get away with it. Alright, we are on, I think we're on Thursday when this one goes up originally. Yes, we are, Thursday the 7th. Um... For those of you listening like a hundred years from now, uh, this was in 2022, also known in the history books as the the what-the-hell-were-you-thinking ages. I know, I know, we lived through it, it it was weird. Anyway, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to stop talking about that nonsense. 44 people resigning in... It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Really, 44 people resigning from uh, their positions in the course of like, what, a couple of days it was? But nope, nope, nope. We're not going to talk politics. We're going to move on. We're going to move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And that is, what the hell was Boris Johnson thinking? (sighs) All right, how about a question we can actually answer? Okay, Hellfreezer's question of the day. And that question is... Favorite quiz show host? I'm saying that because one of my favorite quiz shows is one of the few I actually watch... Is called Big Fat Quiz of the Year, hosted by Jimmy Carr. And they do it twice yearly, usually one just after Christmas on Boxing Day, that's the 26th in the UK. And the other usually, sometimes January, the, the, the second one was a bit late this year, I think it was April by the time it aired, for whatever reason. But uh, it aired, something one I've not seen yet. And uh, it's like an hour and 40 odd minute long quiz show, probably a couple hours with the adverts. Uh, but if you can get them without the ads, it's worth watching. Like, they, they actually have an official YouTube channel now, and they very kindly have actually started putting up full episodes. There's only three of them. There's a lot more episodes than that, but they've only put up three so far. But I'd imagine they might put up some of the older ones eventually, some of the other older ones eventually. Uh, so I think, yeah, Jimmy Carr is probably my favourite quiz show host because it looks like a lot of fun, and I would genuinely like to do that job. Wear a nice suit, stand in front of famous people, make fun of them, All in good fun, of course, um, and get paid for it. That's the dream, maybe one day. So, who's your favourite? Please leave your answer in a comment below. Seriously, 44 people! Idiot! (sighs) And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourselves.